Well, welcome back, everyone. It's great to see the energy level has even gone even higher since this morning. I understand the breakout sessions were phenomenal, and in, even in one, there was exercise that was done. Um, so I'm just saying, there's a whole new standard. <laughs> Um, for the afternoon, there are a couple of things that we want to do. We're going to hear from uh, one of my colleagues and then hear a readout from our breakout sessions before we conclude. Um, before I actually introduce Nancy Ann DeParle, I just want to let you know who's up on stage with me now. We have Ursula Bauer, who's director of the National Center for Chronic Disease Prevention and Health Promotion of the CDC. And Kevin Concanon, who's Undersecretary for Food, Nutrition, and Consumer Services, the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Um, you met earlier Kathleen Merrigan, who's Deputy, Deputy Secretary from USDA. Tony Miller, who's the Deputy Secretary from the Department of Education. And John Jarvis, who's the Director of National Parks from the Department of Interior. So please, well, well I know you've been with them, but please welcome them to the stage. <laughs> And now it is my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Nancy Ann DeParle. Um, recently, the president called Nancy Ann an unsung hero. Um, for those of you who don't know, she heads our Office of Healthcare Reform and was our fearless leader working with the president to get healthcare reform passed just a few weeks ago. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> In fact, the reaction you just had is the reaction we had for a day. Every time, every time Nancy Ann would walk in the room, we'd all give her an ovation. <laughs> um, Nancy Ann has a really wonderful background in healthcare. She was the director of health, the Healthcare Financing Administration during the Clinton administration. She also has experience on the state level where she was the commissioner of the Tennessee Department of Human Services. And she is, for obvious reasons, a remarkable leader a wonderful colleague and friend, and I have to say this, Nancy Ann is one of those people that every time she enters the, a room, the integrity of the room just instantly goes up. So I'd like to introduce to you my friend, Nancy Ann DeParle. Gosh, what a great Friday afternoon. <laughs> it's beautiful here today, and, and this too, and it's great to be with all of you. Um, I see what uh, the First Lady mean, means by let's move. This group is up and active and, as Melody said, exercising, and that's all terrific. And Kevin, it's good to see you. We go way back to state government together, and uh, it's fun to see a lot of old friends from uh, prior parts of my career. I'm really excited to be with you in part of today's meeting on childhood obesity uh, to discuss ways to combat the growing health epidemic. And as Melody said, uh, for over a year I've been honored to be her colleague, and by the way, um, if you ever think that you're not going to do something, um, or you have a difficult problem, and you want someone to close the deal, uh, Melody Barnes <laughs> is the name. <laughs> because uh, Melody is the person who actually called me up and said, would you like to come join us? Um, and she's very persuasive. But uh, <laughs> I've been honored to serve with her as the director of the White House Office of Health Reform. The health reform legislation that President Obama signed into law is a historic victory for the American people. It achieves his goals for lowering costs and giving American families and businesses more control over their health care. So now millions of Americans, workers, families, seniors, and small business owners stand to benefit from lower health care costs, expanded coverage, and tough consumer protections. This legislation is also a monumental victory for parents and children, and there are a number of provisions in the law that will ensure quality, affordable health care for all children. I get excited, actually, when I'm reading through it because there's a lot of things that uh, some of us in this room have worked on for years that by themselves would have been really hard to pass and would have been a big deal, and there's many of them in this bill. So, for example, starting this year, health reform prohibits health insurance companies from denying kids coverage because of a pre-existing condition. And that is a huge victory for kids. 
I want to specifically focus this afternoon on a couple of the key provisions that will address childhood obesity across America. And I believe that these policies will help to meet the goal of the First Lady's Let's Move campaign to solve the epidemic of childhood obesity within a generation. First, health reform invests in a national prevention and public health fund and strategy. That's something that there are people in this room who have been working on for decades, and it got done in this legislation. Health reform promotes prevention, wellness, and the public health, and provides an unprecedented funding commitment in these areas with $15 billion in funding over 10 years. So it's a trust fund for public health and prevention, and we've never had that before. It directs the creation of a national prevention and health promotion strategy, and some of our colleagues from the administration who are working on that are here today. Second, health reform empowers families to make healthier decisions. It creates a web-based prevention tool to help individuals make informed health decisions using science-based guidelines, including information on nutrition, regular exercise, and obesity reduction, and helps them to create a personalized prevention plan. It requires the posting of calorie information by certain chain restaurants on menus and menu boards, as well as the posting of calorie information near each food item on certain vending machines. This is huge, and I want to specifically uh, call out and thank Dawn Sweeney. I saw her, there you are, Dawn, in the National Restaurant Association, which when I first saw this in the HELP Committee bill, where's Janelle? Yeah, I said, wait a minute. Because I remembered from back in the Clinton administration when there, were, there was a rulemaking when we got here that had started in the Bush administration around nutrition labeling. And it had been very contentious. And the prior Bush people had said, boy, this is a nightmare. You know, we're never going to get this done. So I said to Janelle, how, how do you think we're going to get this done? And she said, oh, no. The Restaurant Association supports this. They came to us. They're willing to work with us on it. And I was like, I don't know, Janelle. We'll, we'll see about this. We'll, we'll, we'll see you on the Senate floor with this one, but she was exactly right. There was support, and it's because of the leadership that you and your members showed, Don, that, that we were able to move forward on this. And all I can tell you is that, um, and I, I've told you this story, but I know this makes a difference. Um, I haven't had a mochaccino since <laughs> I was in my favorite Starbucks in New York near an office where I used to work there, and I went in and saw that really it isn't just zero calories like coffee with ice in it. That really, unfortunately, it's a meal in itself. Uh, so I, I, still, I still have them, but not in conjunction with another meal, usually. Uh, and it, it's made a big difference. So we know these kinds of things will, will really help. Third, health reform educates individuals and communities on disease prevention and health promotion, including proper nutrition and regular exercise. It requires the Secretary of HHS to create a national public-private partnership that addresses prevention and health promotion outreach, and to launch a science-based education campaign that raises public awareness on health improvement across all ages. It requires the Secretary to provide guidance to states and health care providers on preventive and obesity-related services available to Medicaid enrollees, and requires each state to design a public awareness campaign on these services. And I think that will be terrific and will have uh, a big impact. Fourth, health reform awards grants that promote individual and community health. The Affordable Care Act creates a community transformation grant program to support community preventive health services, including those that create healthier school environments by promoting healthy food options, physical activity opportunities, and healthy lifestyles. It creates an infrastructure to support active living and access to nutrition, nutritious foods in a safe environment. We all know what a huge difference that makes and how difficult it is in some communities to have access to those kinds of healthy choices. And third, it works to highlight healthy options at restaurants and other food venues. And these things, I think, will make a huge difference in moving us towards uh, better individual and community health. It also provides $25 million in funding for the Childhood Obesity Demonstration Project, which was established through the Children's Health Insurance Program, or CHIP, legislation signed by President Obama. And under this demonstration, the HHS Secretary will award grants to develop a comprehensive and systematic model for reducing childhood obesity. Fifth, the Affordable Care Act removes financial barriers to preventive care and encourages prevention. And I think it's going to be very interesting. This is sort of a, a, a cornucopia for health services researchers. This area in particular, I think, is going to be very interesting to look back on um, you know, 10, 15 years from now and see what a difference it's made. If it's anything like Medicare, 
uh, I think we know that people are going to be living longer, healthier lives. Starting this year, the Affordable Care Act requires all new insurance plans to cover prevention and wellness benefits and exempts these benefits from deductibles and other cost sharing requirements. The essential benefits package for all new plans starting in 2014 has to cover pediatric services, including oral and vision care. It creates an oral health prevention education campaign at CDC to target key populations, including children and pregnant women. There are also other provisions to address childhood obesity, such as a requirement that employers with 50 or more employees must provide a reasonable break time and a place for breastfeeding mothers at work or end the grant program to support the operation of school-based health centers, which will provide comprehensive primary health services to medically underserved children and adolescents. So as you can see, that's just a bit of a random stroll for a Friday afternoon through the Affordable Care Act. But it includes many, many programs and initiatives that we think will help address childhood obesity across America starting this year. And I want to thank each of you for what you did to help make health reform a reality uh, because it's going to, I think, result in a historic uh, transformation in our country uh, with regard to not just childhood obesity but so many other uh, issues of disease and, and really uh, put our country on a much more progressive path. The Let's Move campaign strives to raise a healthier generation of kids and the Affordable Care Act will help us to meet this extremely important goal. So thank you very much for what you're doing and for your support. Great. Thanks so much, Nancy Ann. And before we turn to our moderators to get a readout from the breakout sessions, just a bit of housekeeping. Several of you have asked me, and I'm sure probably other colleagues, if I want to share information, where should I send it? So let me give you that information. Send it to let's move, all one word, let's move at who.eop.gov. Let's move at who.eop.gov. So thank you so much. So why don't we turn to our moderators now, and I'm going to start with Ursula Bauer, who was moderating the Empowering Parents and Caregivers breakout session to hear a report from that one. Thanks so much, Melody. Uh, lots of lively discussion uh, in our uh, breakout group. Uh, and I think one theme uh, that kept recurring was uh, the, the members of our group really wanted to situate uh, childhood obesity within a family and a community context and recognize the important role that environment played in the power that parents have uh, over their own lives and the lives of their children. So some of the recommendations that came out of our group um, focused on changing the environment in order to empower parents. Uh, the first one uh, was addressing the marketing environment and the marketing of uh, less healthful foods to children and, and an effort to achieve a better balance in the mix of the marketing of, of healthful and unhealthful uh, foods uh, across the, uh, the media spectrum. The uh, second recommendation uh, related again to the environment, which was looking at uh, the, the foods that are available in terms of reformulating products so that we have smaller portions, we have lower sodium, we have a, a more uh, healthful uh, selection of foods uh, to choose uh, among. Um, and uh, with that uh, reformulation, better information on the package itself. So front of package labeling that really communicated in an easy and accessible way the uh, information that parents need to make uh, healthful decisions. The third uh, recommendation from our group was to figure out, and I don't think we, we came to exactly how we would do this, but uh, figure out uh, how we can really engage parents uh, to, uh, with simple messages that are actionable, uh, things that they can do in their lives uh, to, to uh, enhance the health of, of their families and their children. The group emphasized that the messages need to be uh, simple and actionable. They should take advantage of those natural learning windows uh, ac across the development of the child from the prenatal period all the way through uh, young, young adulthood. 
and that these messages need to be uh, incorporated across the sectors that, that where, where, where parents are, whether it's uh, through PTAs, through communities, through our churches, uh, through the media, through social networking. Uh, parents need to be hearing the same simple messages from, from a variety of sources. Um, and the hope for, for our group was that this information would help uh, empower parents to demand the healthier products that are going to make their lives easier and demand the healthful environments for themselves, their families, and their children. Great. Thank you so much, and thank you to all the work that was done in that group. Next, we'll have Kevin Concanon from the Healthier Food in Schools group. Yes, uh, like uh, the other groups, I suspect we had uh, no shortage of assertive uh, presenters uh, <laughs> uh, in our group. And uh, uh, no, it was a terrific hour plus. Uh, I would have to say, and I hope I'm not violating uh, the charter of uh, the, the participants, but really I found sitting there and listening so much of what was offered by way of uh, urgency or presentations or perspectives, to me I found happily very much in alignment with the Child Nutrition Act that is currently working its way through Congress. Uh, many of the key elements, and we, uh, with the help of a very capable uh, editor, tried to summarize really the many, many points into like five major themes. But uh, as I looked at those themes and when I came back, I looked at my notes from some of the elements in the Child uh, Nutrition Act, really, they are uh, almost you know, on point, virtually all of them. And uh, it was terrific in that regard. While our charge, the charter to our group, was to really talk about schools, I think we had a very uh, rich early discussion about, hey, we can't really be limited, or should we be limited to schools, because we really need to recognize that, that this all starts uh, during pregnancy, uh, in the early years, in infancy, right up through the preschool years. And so we need to think about the opportunities to impact obesity in children throughout the lifespan, but not wait for the school years in a formal way to start, to really recognize that early childhood has to have a major a place in all of our efforts. And to me, is very, again, compatible with, with the work that has been done, for example, in the WIC program that recognizes that, again, right from pregnancy to those uh, early infancy years. So with that as kind of a, a background theme and an important element, uh, there was a very strong uh, support for and a lot of testimony and various perspectives about the need for national standards uh, for schools, for all meals, all foods in schools, not just those that are provided uh, during lunch or breakfast but uh, for affecting virtually the food supply that comes into schools. And uh, the discussion centered, we had, uh, we had some very uh, insightful presentations or input from uh, several chefs who are part of our group on what they have done in their respective uh, school systems. And uh, we believe that if we have this national standard that it will change over time the food supply that comes into schools. So national standards, a very strong uh, support for it, for again, for all foods uh, in schools. Second major point was, and these aren't necessarily in, in order of priority, but the second element was the, the generalized recognition that we need to ramp up the professional training of all the food service personnel, but not limited to food service personnel, but certainly the people in the food line the nutrition directors, uh, the people who affect what happens uh, uh, to children in the school. But there was recognition that every adult in the school has to be involved. The, uh, the school health people, the teachers, the building principal, the caretakers, the coaches, everybody has to be infused with the culture of the importance of nutrition, of activity, and healthy eating. It shouldn't be left to even the most <coughs> capable uh, food nutrition director, him or herself. It really needs to, and I've seen this, I might say as a parenthetical, when I've gone out to healthier U.S. schools, some of the best schools in the country, it's rare that it is, in fact, I haven't seen it where it's only 
the food service director, however capable she may be. Uh, it has been the principal, the superintendent, a variety of other players. So ramp up the professional training, make it, infuse it in the culture of the school for all adults there. Thirdly, rethink the whole production, the business of meal production. I think this is where we're really informed by, by uh, you know, what people are seeing in those schools that have made these kinds of moves, where uh, the meal production and its delivery are everything from the farm to school, uh, uh, where schools now, some of the more fortunate schools across the country, uh, have gardens, have access to foods they are growing for the school, and they're seeing in those schools the impact on their consumers, the, the children in those schools, that are attracted to these foods when they learn about foods are much more likely to eat those healthy foods, those less processed foods. And uh, there was a recognition of we need to be creative in schools to sort of encourage more of an entrepreneurial approach. I might say as an aside, too, uh, that uh, uh, in some instances uh, it, was, it was mentioned during the discussion from some quarters Gee, we'd like to do this in our school, but USDA, the rules, the regulations around school meals wouldn't allow us to do it. There is a huge mythology out there about the limitations in that regard. So I think if nothing else, we would want to disabuse people of, of the sense that, hey, I can't do that. We can't grow local foods. We can't source local foods uh, through farms in our area. We're seeing that happen here and there across the country. And I might say the Child Nutrition Act has provisions in it and proposed uh, financing to increase the capacity nationally for us to encourage to work not only with the schools but with the farmers so that we have more of this. But there's a recognition, involve the kids, think locally, uh, think about and consider ways in which we structure uh, the, full, this, the food preparation for particularly some of the large schools. It was mentioned so many of our schools were you know, constructed 100, 150 years ago, some of them. They don't have modern kitchen facilities. So we need to think about are there ways, uh, you know, one school system mentioned where they're feeding 85,000 children each day through 20 centralized kitchens. Think about ways we deliver food and structure it. That's going to affect the quality and the presentation of those foods. The fourth area for us, again, for our group was nutrition education. Again, the recognition that shouldn't be uh, you know, a 40-minute uh, hour or a class that's held three times a week. It really needs to extend across the, uh, across the school environment. And again, some of the best schools that I've seen, they use it in the music program, they use it in the, in the math program, they use it in the, uh, in the art program, in the pottery or the, or the uh, drawing classes. And to use uh, the, the cafeteria experience for children as a teachable moment, I think there was a recognition. You can, you, and some folks mentioned their own personal, uh, the awakening for them of the importance of chemistry class when it was related to food. But prior to that, uh, the, uh, the tables didn't necessarily excite them, a different type of table. Uh, anyway, the fifth uh, was to integrate across all programs uh, at the federal level and authorities to incent change for good performance. And I think there was a recognition there that, and I've heard this from school nutrition folks, their success is really dependent upon the commitment of a building principal or the superintendent of schools. That you really need the commitment that cuts across, that doesn't limit it or isolate it to the nutrition uh, programs and uh, what was expressed as uh, as a recommendation within our group, think about ways of implanting, embedding in some of the other federal recognition for schools as an example, or I would say child care centers, or any of the child serving institutions, the child welfare system. Think about ways of incenting recognition uh, in those programs from the re the core federal agencies' recognition of better, more enlightened uh, nutrition for children. That was it. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Kathleen, you were moderating 
excuse me, the access to healthy and affordable foods breakout. Your report. Thanks, Melody. Uh, an important observation to begin. We recognize that food access is in, uh, a food system issue. And so we talked about some of the complexities around food systems. And then we also had a very important conversation about strategy, that whatever we do required strategic collaborations that involved as much local folk as possible, reflecting the demographics of an area, because there's not going to be one solution to food access. Maybe it's mobile groceries, maybe it's urban gardens, maybe it's farmers markets, maybe it's grocery stores. But again, getting the local people involved in that strategic collaboration is important. Our list of three. Um, first, uh, culturally competent education. We talked about advertisements, celebrities, schools, pediatricians, and a reminder that um, we're not only talking about food deserts, but food swamps as well, where you're just, I guess, oversaturated with bad food too, or not bad food, but that doesn't facilitate good choices. And so education is a very important component. Um, secondly, uh, improved purchasing power and well-structured incentives. We talked a lot about our nutrition program, SNAP, WIC, and again, echoing what I said earlier today about the uh, hunger and obesity, two sides of the same coin, and we got to make sure that those programs empower people to purchase um, food, and the right food. And third, uh, breastfeeding, that mother's milk is the first food, and we have to think of a variety of strategies to make sure that um, that access is, uh, is there fully and that, that, that agenda is fully realized. So my group's thinking, well, you didn't talk about healthy food financing initiative, which is in the FY11 budget proposal. Well, we had a list of 36 that we came up with. <laughs> I'm submitting all 36 ideas uh, to the task force. Um, but healthy food financing, we decided to put a star by it. Mm -hmm because everyone pretty much in my group prefaced the remarks by saying this is a really exciting initiative. Thanks to the First Lady. Thanks to the President for kicking this off, and we hope to see it across the finish line. Great. Thank you. And Tony and John, you are representing the Increased Opportunities for Physical Activity Group. Why don't we start with you, Tony? Sure. Uh, thank you, Melody. Uh, uh, I think like like all the breakout groups, we had a very uh, energized uh, and engaged uh, discussion. Uh, we actually did have uh, physical activity in our group. Uh, you may be seeing it on YouTube tonight. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to go viral, I think. Uh, but but I, I, one, let me, I just want to, I think, uh, our, our group being, so, I'm sure, again, symbolic of all the others, it was, I, I found it personally very both encouraging and inspiring, the level of engagement and interaction around this agenda. And I think uh, knowing how being from the Department of Education, the role that we play is only going to be as good as the way we can partnership and mobilize the, the community at large, right, at the state and local level, NGOs, private sector, and government. And so it was very inspiring to participate in today's session to, to experience firsthand that energy and partnership. Uh, in terms of the, uh, the specific recommendations we came up with, uh, we'll tag team here first. One, it was recognizing the important roles that schools play as, as a potential opportunity to stimulate and sustain physical activity and to start that at an early age and sustain it through, through, the, through the school years. Uh, it's recognizing that in the current environment of constrained resources as well as uh, a trend towards narr the narrowing of the curriculum, that there must be an explicit rec recognition and recommendation to include physical activity as part of any expanded and extended day. And that can be both the, not just the traditional day, but how do we increasingly think about an extended day and or after school programs that explicitly recognize physical activity. Consistent with that, it was having a clearer, more simplified definition of what is physical activity. And that physical activity needs to be expanded to include not just the traditional team competitive sports, but a whole range of sports that are gonna be much more inclusive to, and gender sensitive, right? children, girls versus boys, students with disabilities, because it's recognizing the importance <coughs> of physical activity is not always just a physical, physical component to it, but there's an emotional component to it as well. And so we need to have that more robust one understanding of what is physical activity, and it needs to be embedded in our, in our overall structure of the school day. Okay, um, first of all, I wanna thank uh, uh, the planners here for inviting 
uh, the, the parks community uh, to this dialogue because we provide um, these venues for uh, millions and millions of folks around the country and are often not thought of in light of the, these kinds of challenging issues like obesity. So one of the key uh, concerns that was raised, a barrier concern, is really land use planning and access. Um, how the physical environment, the structure that is out there in communities uh, really creates uh, disincentives uh, to physical activity. Whether or not uh, those uh, facilities are um, the school playground um, that uh, may be totally structured around asphalt and, and team sports and not really provide a range of activities uh, that can be uh, uh, all kids, whether they have disabilities or are not participants in team sports, can be a part of that. And then also access to those places from communities, within communities. And so the focus of land use planning, um, the focus of transportation funding, both federal and state, to uh, help build those connections. Uh, there's already programs for safe routes to schools, but there should also be safe routes to parks. Um, that, and I believe that just like there are food deserts, there are park deserts, there are communities that do not have parks, or those parks have been taken over uh, by drug, drug and gang activity so that they are no longer safe. And so community activism to bring those back, reinvestment in the infrastructure that has gone into decline to make them safe uh, for, uh, for physical activity is, is absolutely one of the keys. Uh, we have four, so we're tag teaming. Okay. Next, <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, oh. Next is uh, <clears throat> the idea that there are, in fact, uh, many promising programs out there that people aren't aware of. And frankly, there are other programs. There's not enough research and evidence to understand what, what are some of the more promising and effective programs. So given that the specific recommendation is, can we aggregate as well as help facilitate the, the, the dissemination of information on what are either proven effective programs, policies, and practices, as well as those that are promising? Because there's a recognition that there's a lot of learning that needs to happen in a very short period of time. And we, while we want to focus on evidence over time, we need to also recognize that there, there's important for these learnings in the near term as well. And so how do we actually aggregate and make this information much more available so that effective programs in Florida can be picked up in Kansas, can be picked up in Maine, can be picked up in Texas? And so the notion of, again, creating a more efficient market by access to information is a specific recommendation. Okay. And, and last uh, from our group, <clears throat> You know, even though this has a somewhat of a formal education focus and it is, uh, is titled on childhood, we cannot forget the role the parents play in this whole initiative. That in many cases, the, uh, the life of that child is started at, you know, at birth with uh, what they're fed and how they're, how they're active. And so engaging parents uh, at the very early, particularly new parents, uh, is really key. In, uh, as a side, in Australia, um, every mother that gives birth to a child uh, in, an, in a hospital in Australia gets a personal invitation to the park system uh, uh, in her package. Um, and, uh, and that is followed up. Uh, yeah, I'm stealing that idea, by the way. Um, <laughs> and <clears throat> so I think that focusing on uh, programs for families that get them all active and that they are fun. We can't forget the fun side of this, that we tend to focus so much on the sort of negative side <laughs> of this issue. But to fix it can be fun. And we need to find those kinds of fun activities at the community level, at the parent level, at the family level in order to really move this. Great, well thank you all of you um, and your teams as well, thank you. And as we're wrapping up, I also want to thank a couple of other people. Um, Elizabeth Wilkins in the back. I want to thank Elizabeth. Many of you probably heard from her. She's <laughs> done a terrific job. And Martha Coven, who leads our Mobility and Opportunity Office. <laughs> and also our colleagues and 
OMB and NEC, the First Lady's Office, our colleagues and agencies across the government that many of you have had an opportunity to work with today. I think it's representative of what we want to bring and what we think is necessary, which is an across-the-board landscape approach to this problem. So I want to thank all of you for your participation and for your excellence and, and for your hard work on this. And certainly, I want to thank you all for being here. You all have, I know, it's not just your work today, it is the work that you've been doing for months and years and years on this topic, your expertise. We know that you have been out and about all over the country devoting so much time and dedication to this. So thank you for that and thank you for sharing that with us because it is going to make all the difference in the world. And as I said in the beginning, we know that this is a collaborative effort that this cuts across all sectors. This isn't, you know, we're the government and we're here to help. This is, we're the government and we want to partner with you across all the sectors. So thank you for what you've been doing. Thank you for being here for today. And thank you for what we will ask you to do and do in partnership with us in the future. You should also know that um, at the beginning of this effort, back at the beginning of February, the president gave us 90 days to come up with a task force report, which at the time we thought, oh, 90 days. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> But the clock is ticking, so on the week of May 10th, about that time, there will be a task force report. Please keep your eye out for it, and we'll want your comments and your thoughts, and most importantly, we will need your assistance so that we can go forward and implement it. So thank you again for being here today. We look forward to working with you in the future.